well, I guess it's about time we got to his story. It's, uh, it's been a while since that one. Things never really felt the same after those days when we lost that relic of the old world. He was a good man. The, the good heart. Just wish everyone could have seen him that way, especially him. But that's all the past now, so no more than just a story to you and one I should... I guess I should start telling instead of just reminiscing about, huh? Alright, well, I'd recommend you get comfortable if I were you, because you can't start with just old Masaoka. We have a few things we have to cover along with him, too. To understand Masaoka, his motivations, choices, and the direction of his life, it's impossible not to look at the early stages of it, the very same years as Sybil was rising to power. Masaoka was born on June 6, 2058, becoming a detective at the CID at age 22, and having his only child four and a half years later. His life as a detective lasted a further seven years until 2091 when his job at the CID was dissolved and replaced within the MWPSB by the position of inspector, which he worked for as two years before being designated as a latent criminal, spending half a year in a rehab facility, and then becoming an enforcer with Division 3 that same year, 2093. Later, he transfers to his son's Division 1, where he remains until the story begins eight years later in 2112. Now this is great and all, but what's special about this story? Well, let's look at how the dates compare to the rise, acceptance, and implementation of the Sybil system. The earliest date in Psychopath's lore is, quite ironically, 2020, where the world destabilizes after the collapse of the economy coupled with food and water shortages. In 2031, Japan implemented vocational aptitude exams, coupled with the earliest precursor of Sybil, a supercomputer capable of doing the necessary calculations for a cymatic scan. Now this isn't the same as the scans we see in 2112 onward. The crime coefficient, a single part of the larger psychopaths reading, and the value which determined latent criminality wouldn't be implemented until decades later. But this early combination led to the stabilization of the Japanese economy in 2051, a ripple effect which changed the course of their society. The case for isolation from the rest of the still destabilized world was made and implemented by 2061 with the advent of hyperotes protected by the Uka no Mitama virus. Ten years later, full enforcement of the civil system was achieved, leading to complete societal stabilization by 2081. Ten years after that, the crime coefficient, technology, was implemented, leading to the modern civil we see in 2112 and onwards. Masaoka, being born in 2058, grew up just as Japan became self-sufficient, overcoming fully the shortages that led the world to chaos. He was 13 when full enforcement of Sybil began, meaning he was well aware of what a world without Sybil was like, and his life was likely free from some of its grasp. However, with full stabilization not coming until he was 23, it means likely he saw some of the unrest, suffering, and other after-effects of a collapsed world. This may have strengthened his desire to become a detective, a job he worked for the tail end of the old world. By the time Sybil replaced his work, he was 11 years deep into his career without a single major change. It's safe to say he decided on his life's purpose, believing in society's need for a good detective. But society had decided they no longer needed him. He expresses how he felt about this change to his son years later. The gun never said it, but it clearly told me my detective work was obsolete. We can't say for sure how dedicated or good a detective Masayoka was for sure, but look at the man we see even once his purpose was stripped away. He cracks jokes about not wanting to work, saying to Akane on her first case, You could order us to take a coffee break and sit on our asses. I don't think we'd argue with that. And on her second, Well, let's just keep our fingers crossed. Today's a little more laid back. But his actions tell a different story. Once they start a hunt, he gets serious. He uses hand signs and whistles so they can't be identified or give away their position. He can spot someone ready to commit a crime from a simple glance, or the same for someone who's just hiding part of the truth. He's old school, but skilled and passes on genuine advice. His carefree demeanor and soft looks fade into a harsher gaze and dedicated attention. 
Even just his style and the mood surrounding him is that of a classical detective. The trench coat sipping on whiskey with a loosened tie, thinking over a dramatic past. He even had the classic safe house for if he got in hot water. We can't say for sure, but I don't think anyone would doubt his commitment to his career in those days based on this modern adaptation. With that, it must be pretty easy to see why he became so disillusioned with this forceful change of society and his role in it. For all his character and charm, he wasn't a flawless individual. I mean, yeah, we had some people who were willing to give up their whole purpose moving on to a new society, like Reuichi Oreo, but can we really expect people to be that perfect? Is it even something we should really be thinking about? He was a good man. He was a great man, but not many people are that perfect is all. And I'm not saying we can blame him for this, but I think it'll become clear in some of what we talk about later. He came to low in a lot of society. But I should, should get back on track here. It's, it's a little off topic. So, Gino was born in 2084, so he was about seven when his father's work was taken away from him. And this, God, I must have doubled or tripled, I might even go farther than tripled the pressure he was feeling to fulfill a purpose, to do anything he could do just to help his family. You know, make sure they're fed and, and, and happy and everything that goes along with it. When he was the product of two people who grew up in a time where there were food shortages, where there wasn't any stability at all, I mean, they had to have imprinted some of that care for family on him. I mean, yeah, maybe he could have done something else, but uh, what would his family have done in the meantime, if they would even be okay? I mean, we don't even know what aptitude Sybil would have given him, if any other ones. He was around uh, before that was fully implemented. It's, it's more of a mess when you come from his time, let's just say that. It was a period of uncertainty, as he explains to Akane, If anyone showed a high crime coefficient, that was enough for their whole family to get treated as if they were all latent criminals. There was panic with these changes, and we have to take all of these factors into account to establish his character. He was witnessing families being torn apart, contrary actions to the probable lofty promises made about a perfect system. Here's a man worried not just about his place in society, but if he can remain in it and how his family will fare under his actions. Continuing even somewhat similar work with the MWPSB was probably the clearest option in his head. A man later described as a technophobe, he would have understood little of why this was happening or what a change would look like, what to do in a modern career. So he sticks with what he knew for as long as he could until society came for him as well. With an eight-year-old son at home, Masayoka was ripped away from his family forever. Now, it's, it's pretty safe to wonder how a man so contrary to the civil system, the lord of society who ripped away his life and called him useless, came to serve that very system. I mean, he said all the time he made his peace with the world. For a while, I never really got why. Knowing his story, knowing where he came from, I don't see many people who would have been able to say that. But for all the worst that he saw of Sybil, he also knew a world without it. One with more hunger and more pain and no stabilization or anything on the whole. He saw these things disappear under the role of new technology and eventually watched as his purpose didn't just become obsolete in word, but in practice as well. He watched as most of society was happy, knowing his son would grow up in a world much better than the one he saw as a child. And the only society left on Earth where his family could live and that kind of peace makes a little more sense with all of that in mind. He knew that no matter what he felt, he would never be able to change the world either way. He couldn't even save his own world. So he made peace with what was left, or as a better way to put it, he grew complacent with it. He still hates many things about it, as he openly expresses on various occasions then I had to trade in my pistol for a new gun that could talk back to me. Wipe each and everything you learn there out of your head as quickly as you can. None of that crap's gonna help you on a real case. Thanks to my skills as a peace officer, I'm now treated as a glorified hunting dog. Yet he puts his trust in Sybil's judgment, even when it would be completely contrary to his own instincts. He expresses how unreasonable Sybil and this world are, but tells Akane to simply put her faith in the Dominator as well. 
All you gotta do is follow the Dominator's commands. If it says shoot, then shoot. You probably think that sounds unreasonable, huh? Well, let me tell you, all the time I've spent on this job, I have yet to encounter a single reasonable thing. This isn't an acceptance of the world, it's a complacency with the things he hated. It's saying, I can't beat it, so I guess I have to join it. And joining it quite directly is what he does, returning to a facsimile of his former work. And I think this is what shows that complacency more than anything else. Clearly, work as an inspector is a complete bastardization of what he once was. It's no secret that before Akane, those inspectors are pretty terrible at their jobs. Part of the description is sitting back and letting the enforcers do the work while the other part is protecting your own crime coefficient. It's glorified babysitting, really. Work as an enforcer, though, is only a bit of a bastardization of Masaoka's former line of work. You still got to take part in the hunt of criminals, analyzing the scene, drawing your own conclusions, following your instincts, as long as the inspectors weren't stymieing him. Well, it may not be what he loved, it's like something he knew very well. If we're being honest, the only work he ever really knew. And returning to this was... It was just the easiest solution. I don't think we can blame him for that. I don't think anyone modern can blame him for that. He doesn't have to learn many new skills. In fact, he's hardly seen doing digital work at all where everyone else does to some degree. He doesn't have to shift his mindset or purpose much outside of his coming to terms. He's returning to some of these same people he knew before his designation as a latent criminal and supposedly there was even a respect for him and his skills there. He's not moving on to something new, He's hardly doing anything new in his work. And as he admits, he doesn't have the same drive or desire for justice that Kogami and Akane do. I get the impression that he's convinced the only place justice actually exists is within the depths of that darkness. Are you trying to tell me that you have lost that commitment? Maybe. I don't know. It's always said there's some truth in comedy, so maybe his earlier jokes about doing nothing weren't entirely an icebreaker for his carefree attitude. In doing exactly what he's told, listening blindly to the Dominators and growing stale in his work, he proves his complacency. It makes him warm and kind and gentle, this peace he has with his standing in the world. But it also means he's accepted his life will never be anything more. A sad truth of the psychopath's world and one that makes Masaoka one of the most telling cases of Sybil's judgment. I think there's at least one time we can argue he was gunning for something to a greater degree though, something to, to regain a little bit of the purpose that he had lost in life. And that was with his son, with Gino. I mean, due to the nature of healthcare in this world, he was absent from his son life from, son's life from the age of seven or eight onwards. And with Gino's general thought process, we can assume any kind of visitation was denied on his child's part. But I, I did a little bit of snooping here and there. And... Okay, so I was rummaging through the personnel files one day, just trying to understand his story a little bit better. And I noticed something odd about his and Gino's emergency contacts. I mean, you know we have to have those. They both had Gino's grandma, or you know, Masaoka's mother-in-law. It wasn't anyone from his family, it was someone from Gino's. I mean, for this to be his emergency contact, the same as his son's, they must have spoken at some point, him and his mother-in-law, to make that happen. That means he had some sort of contact with someone who knew his son at least. At least. Maybe for all those years, he had some small chances to ask about his son's life, to hear about him from afar and hope that one day he could win back the love society tore away. The warmth we mentioned that's present in almost all of his actions might be a reaction to these bits of knowledge and that desire. Because he was angry at the world, stubborn and unable to adapt in time, he lost his life and he lost his son. He speaks to how, once he let that feeling go, his coefficient stabilized. By the time I stopped being angry and I made my peace with this world, my crime coefficient had stabilized. In his eyes, it's not just his line of work that made him a latent criminal, but that rage as well. So he tries to become the opposite of that. He's calm in his reactions, his spare time spent painting in his simple and unassuming room. 
He doesn't see himself as a wise man, but an experienced one to pass on bits of anecdotal wisdom. He apologizes for others' bad behavior, both Kogami and Ginoza, and plays the middle ground when two people are having a conflict. Peace is a certain trait of his new character. He becomes something of a father figure at the MWPSB, like a practice for one day being a real father once again. And here's something else. The old man was in Division 3 up until 2106 was. Gino, he started in 2104. Masaoka knew who he was trying to transfer under. There's not many reasons to transfer a division like that. He probably was trying to transfer that entire two years knowing that process. With the bits of info he may have gotten about Gino, maybe he knew what his son's career path was. I mean, Sybil doesn't give us the most options. Some it does, some it doesn't, some have none. But smart people like Akane and like Ginoza, they get more options than the rest. And Masaoka, seeing his son become the, the modern version of his once proud job, he might have decided he still had some kind of purpose in that. To be a real father for the first time in years. I mean, his son's becoming the thing he couldn't be. Maybe that's why he was so open and honest about his past and the mistakes he made. He never had a problem explaining it all, no matter how many times it was. Why would he? No parent wants to see their kids make the same mistakes like that. So we had to learn to express those mistakes to his son in some way, maybe like we were all practice, and he needed it because his son was the toughest customer to ever get to listen to him. He has work to do. He often struggles to properly comfort people with these words, struggling with Akane in episode two. Don't get me wrong here. But then later succeeding in episode nine. He doesn't want it to ever happen again. But does he have to be a jerk? No, you're right, he doesn't. In the moment, he can tend to have a little bit of heat left, like headbutting Kogami to keep him down, knowing words won't do the trick. He doesn't always stand up to his son's bad behavior and, in many ways, actively encourages it. In learning to roll with every single punch, he doesn't have the desire left to push back against the harsh rhetoric used against him and the other enforcers. In fact, often taking it for his own use, saying things like, It's hard to explain, but a beast can sniff out his own. However, allowing this hard line between inspector and enforcer to exist and be strengthened has his best interests at heart. It's not just about a lack of desire or will, but because he wants to be seen as a hunting dog, the scum of society, or whatever words are harshest and whatever words are used. He says to Akane early on, But you break everything down to its basic nature, and I think it might be easier for you if you just stuck to your own side. And offers no rebuke to Ginoza, even when he directly says things like, Don't get too friendly, enforcer. Okay. Accepting this lower status means presenting it as true and undesirable. Something no inspector should be okay with becoming, something his son will never want. Ginoza already dislikes his father. What's the damage in leaning into what his son hates if it keeps him further from it? Prove him right about latent criminals and enforcers, and it only strengthens his drive to never be one. And there's another reason he could take this clear stratification between the positions. I mean, being a detective was dangerous work. I guess it still is, but the danger in Masaoka's day was different. It was very physical. Today, it's, it's all mental. It's all about protecting yourself. And being a good detective is no longer, well, good. For all the shortcomings we discussed, it's undeniable in this world that thinking like a criminal is the same as being one. And what makes the best detective? Well, the ability to think like a criminal. It's what he always said, at least. It makes sense. I mean, and this is, again, the purpose of those distinctions, and because of that, Masaoka would want them to be present and want to enforce them himself. I mean, if the enforcers are doing all of the hard work, the dirty jobs, the clouds went too, then the inspectors and his son get to stay clear. The best thing Masayoka can hope for his son is for him to be a terrible detective, but the greatest inspector. His greatest failure was, conversely, being a good detective because society later decided that that was no longer positive. 
He's not just teaching his mistakes so others don't follow them, but making sure they never even have the chance to. Ginoza says in their final moments together, You don't expect anything from me. Like catching Makishima. You never thought I had a chance, did you? And to some extent, that's true. Sybil, from the old man's perspective, is a technological thief which robbed life of its purpose. Yet he grew complacent with the nature of the beast, accepting that life had simply become something meaningful in a different way, a way he could never achieve, but that his son was fully poised to. It's not about working or being the best anymore. It's up for debate what life in this world is about, but it's present in every character except Akane that work isn't part of it now that Sybil places everyone in their best fit. As far as Masayoka is concerned, not expecting anything of his son as a detective is the best thing he can do, shielding him from the underbelly of the world by taking it upon himself. It's fitting that his last act as a father is doing just that, shielding his son from danger. His last words to Ginoza are quite simple. I'm no detective. I don't deserve the title. And from what we've seen and discussed, he's not a detective. He's not existing to hunt down criminals and bring them to justice. He accepted Sybil's justice, one he hated and enforced it unflinchingly by their collective will. He isn't finding obsession in his cases, determined to make the world a safer place by saving everyday people from horrid fates. He's not even really giving effort to these things. What he gives effort to, and the title he is deserving of, is Father. A man who accepted that his purpose was gone, accepted that the world no longer needed him, as long as he could protect his son. The years spent growing and changing into a man who could do so. The practice with everyone around him who came to see him for what his son never quite did. A father. His life was given to his son at the end even in the most literal way. Masayoka isn't just the epitome of those left behind by Sybil, but also the tragic tale of a man who never got to be a father. One who grew complacent with every other fact to try and claw that back. His tale isn't a straightforward shot through society, but a winding path spanning over many cases, roles, lives, and so much more. Well, I guess that's about it for the old man's story. It's an interesting one for today, you really don't see much like it anymore. I guess I never really did much either. If I'm honest with you, a lot of it was just heard in passing, and I can't tell you how honest he was or not. But I never had a reason to doubt someone like him. He had no reason to lie, and enforcers just don't in general. It feels like such a waste to not put his honesty to something. All that work just for his son to end up in the same spot, giving his life just to keep him alive, and then, God damn, it just makes you want to go back and somehow say thanks, even if it's for someone else, because God knows the kid didn't say it at the time. I guess that's that though. Can't change how we got here, just where we're gonna go from here. And if I were you, that's what I'd take from this. Sometimes the world comes along and screws your life up, and sometimes it's pretty good too. It leaves you just a few little pieces that don't really mean too much. But we get to decide what those pieces mean and what we're gonna build with them from there. So I'd keep those pieces close if that happens, even if they're all you got. You get to build something new, and you get to decide what they build into. But anyway, that's the end of the story. So I hope you like my ramblings today. So let me know what you thought, or give it a thumbs up or whatever if you did. I'll have my Patreon below if you think it was that good of a story, but obviously no pressure there. I'm just happy I was able to sit down and, and tell a story that really should keep going. So I mean, thanks for, for coming by and letting me share that story. So. I hope we'll get to do it again sometimes.